Uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. We're doing a little series called Personalizing the Great Commission. First week, we looked at why it's important and tried to make the case that it's for everybody. And then last week, really tried to make the case that it's for you. We looked at the word go. We looked at the word go last week. We've been talking a little bit about all the problems in the culture. George Burns once said, it's too bad that all the people that know how to fix our country are busy driving cabs and cutting hair. <laughs> and I would add tending bar. We have, though, in this text that we're looking at for these six weeks, You can make the case that all the people who really know how to fix our country are busy uh, not becoming disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you think about it, let's take a look at Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to your denomination. Now, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, and most of you have heard this before, but the old bromide is, is that any time you see the word therefore, you should ask, what is it there for? And it's there because all of this authority has been given to uh, Jesus. And for that reason, go and make Christians. Well, it's interesting, it doesn't say that. It says, go and make disciples. Uh, It's interesting, it doesn't say, go and make converts. It says, go and make disciples. There are 42 million men in the United States who profess faith in Christ, and only 6 million of them are involved in discipleship. One in seven professors, that means six out of seven professors of Christ are not involved in a Bible study like we're involved in here. And when you do look at all the problems that we have in our nation, and you look at how many Christians we have, dare I say this? We really don't need any more Christians. (laughs) We haven't done a good job with the Christians we already have. Why should God entrust any more to us? Just imagine that you're the the president of a law firm with a hundred lawyers. And you have doubled in size over the last three years. Three years ago, you only had 50 lawyers. Now you have a hundred lawyers. Incredible growth. But in order to, uh, to accomplish this, you had to compromise your hiring standards. You had to take on people who weren't quite as as enthusiastic about the law. You had to... And now what you have is you have a law firm full of people, and you didn't have the time to really do a good job training the ones you did hire, and so as a result, you have a law firm full of these green lawyers who don't really have a very good understanding of the law. In the process of recruiting, you've neglected a lot of your best clients, and they're feeling a little left out. Many of the case files are in a shambles. Your reputation has been sullied. You're a laughing stock in the community. And now, you as the president of the law firm, go to your board of directors and say, wow, we've had this phenomenal growth. We've doubled in size in the last three years, and, and uh, I would like your permission to, to do it again over the next three years. I'd like to double again. I'd like to have 200 lawyers three years from now. What would you say if you're the board of directors? You'd say, are you nuts? You haven't done a very good job training the lawyers we already have. Why do you think we would allow you to hire more lawyers? And probably, if you had any sense, you'd say also, you're fired. 
But that's exactly, when you think about what's happened in our church, that's exactly what's happened. We've recruited but not trained six out of seven people who profess to be Christ. So we really haven't serviced what we sold. So what I would suggest is maybe, maybe we should stop selling and start servicing what we already sold. Maybe we ought to go ahead and train the people we've already recruited. Make sense? Does this make sense? All right, so I don't really mean that we don't need any more Christians. Okay. But I do think that there ought to be a, a different sense of priority. All the statistics tell us that somewhere around 9 out of 10 people who profess Jesus Christ come in the front door and go right out the back within a few months. So you have this revolving door of people who pray the prayer and then never do anything about it. Well, were they really having a change of the will? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe some of them, but probably most of them really didn't understand what it means to become uh, a disciple of Jesus Christ. So now, here we are. Therefore, go and make disciples. So what I want us to do is focus for the next three weeks on this word disciples. You've heard me say before that a great message will answer a question that you probably have never thought about before. Uh, a good message will answer a question that you probably have never thought about before. But I think the, the great message answers the question that you wonder about all the time, but you would never ask because you don't want to sound like an idiot or a heretic. And so we have a question like that to look at for the next three weeks, and that is, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? It's, it's a word that we use all the time, but my experience is, is that there really is no consensus opinion among believers about what is a disciple. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the question, what is a disciple? And uh, we're going to begin by, uh, we'll look at some summaries. And then we will try to find a, uh, a focal point. That's what we'll do today. And then we will take a, a little look at uh, WWJD. So let's begin by just sort of brainstorming about what we already know about what it means to be a disciple. What are, some of the, what are some of the different ways that you would define or describe what it means to be a disciple? What, is, what are some of the ways? What is a disciple? Say it again. Okay, so a believer in, in Christ. Okay, so there's the issue of the faith piece. Okay, what else? What's that? Okay, one who is disciplined. Okay, what else? A learner, okay? Actually, even the word disciple, the, 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 the technical definition of the word disciple is learner or pupil. Uh, but when used in conjunction with Jesus Christ, means an adherent to the teachings of Jesus. Yes, over here. John? What is it? Okay, so someone who shares their faith. All right, yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the self-sacrifice of our life. Do you have, what is it? Teacher. Okay, so someone who is willing to pass along the, what they have received. What else? A lover. Who said that? Yeah. I always like to know who the lovers are. <laughs> <clears throat> Are you a good lover? Never mind. <laughs> Miles? What is it? Huh? Okay, so to become like or the imitation of? Uh, 
Say it again, please. Open to instruction. Okay. Well, these are all these are all excellent ideas. <clears throat> and uh, it's interesting when you begin to try to take a very broad, deep, and rich concept as as the concept of disciple is. It's interesting because <clears throat> you have to develop summaries. You you pick ways, you pick shorthand catchwords, if you will, that sort of summarize in, in your mind's eye what it means to be that thing. And so in, in the scriptures, we find some summaries also of what it means to be a disciple. And our Lord and Savior Jesus himself gives us the most important summary of all of what it means to be a disciple. And we're going to look at that at John chapter 13, 34. So if you would... Turn to John, we're done in Matthew, John chapter 13, verse 34. And this is the focal point for what it really means to be a disciple. This is Jesus. This is the sometimes called the royal law. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. Now just stop there. Is there anything new about that command? Love one another? At this point, having read only as far as we have, there's really nothing new here. Because love one another is already part of The law. In other words, the great command is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second one is love your neighbor as yourself. So, really, there's nothing new yet about this. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. So, there's the new. In other words, there's something about the way that Jesus loves us. There's something about the way that Jesus loves us that we are to reproduce in the way that we love others other people. And then watch this, verse 35. All men will know that you are my Christians. No. All men will know you are my converts. No. All men will know that you are my worshipers. No. All men will know you are my disciples. My pupils, my students, all men will know you are my disciples if, what? You love one another. If you love one another. Here's the big idea this morning. The focal point for a disciple is the law of love. The focal point for a disciple is the law of love. That's the focal point. Now, it's interesting, if you will, turn to Romans chapter 13. Verse 8, and what I want to show you is, is that even Jesus is using this loving one another the way that he's loved us as a summary of his own. It's a summary. In other words, he's using it to sum up a number of ideas, and we see how, he, he, how Paul fleshes this out for us in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. If you don't have a Bible, let me encourage you to look on with somebody who does not uh, has one, and if you uh, see somebody that does not have one, why don't you let them look on with you? I'd really like you to see this uh, with your own eyes. Verse 8. Paul writes, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. So now Paul has has converted this command of Jesus into a, a debt that we owe, which is kind of interesting. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Isn't that interesting? He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So the commandments do not commit adultery... Do not murder, don't steal, don't covet, 
and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up. See there? Summarized. It's a summary. All the commandments that have been given. Um, staring through the window of the woman that lives next door. Taking home pens, pencils, sharpies, and highlighters. All of these things. They're all summed up in this one, one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, to, to love your neighbor as yourself means that you keep the commandments. That's, that's how you... That's what it means. Loving your neighbor is a summary statement for obeying Christ's commandments. Look at verse 10. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay. I like the Living Bible. It says this. All ten are wrapped up in this one. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's why it fully satisfies all of God's requirements. It is the only law you need. We don't do that. Yes, as a matter of fact, it does need, mean that you, we need to love the Muslims, too. Okay? Now, how has Jesus loved us? We're supposed to love others the way that he has loved us. How has he loved us? How has he loved us? Hmm? Say it again. Okay, he, he, he's loved us sacrificially. He gave his life. He's loved us perfectly, hasn't he? It's interesting. Jesus has loved me just as I am. Now, this is radical stuff. If the focal point for a disciple is the law of love, and, uh, and that means to love others the way that Jesus has loved us, and we, we look at the way that Jesus has loved us, and he's loved us just like we are, begin to think about the implications of this for other people and our relationships with other people. The Muslims, for example. Our wives. Our co-workers. It's pretty radical, pretty radical thinking. There's another way that Jesus has loved me, too. He's loved me just as I am. And because he loves me just as I am, he loves me too much to leave me just as I am. And so we, we do see this sharpening that takes place. And you love, you love your children too much to leave them just as they are, yes? And when you see a co-worker beginning to spin out of control and... and uh, talk sharply to other people and uh, have relationship problems, <laughs> part of loving them as Christ loves you is to love them enough to tell them that that's wrong, to hold them accountable. But it's interesting when we, we see the way that Jesus works to change people. I wrote this down. Jesus never tried to regulate, control or force a change of heart. Can you think of a single example where Jesus ever tried to regulate, control, or force a change of heart? Can you think of a single example? I can't. Do you have an example? Did he attempt to regulate, control, or force a change of heart? Yeah, he, he, threw him out. Yeah, he might be right. You might be right. <laughs> I'm going to look into it. <laughs> the normal way that, that Jesus works with us is that he works through vision. 
He paints the picture. He tells the story. Yes? He, in other words, instead of beating people down, he, he holds up the vision of what they can be. And then he invites them to that. And so when we want to change our wife, change our coworker, change our kids, we can tell them what they shouldn't be doing. We can try to regulate and control and force particular behavior, force change, or we can hold up to them the vision of what they're supposed to become. And then, like Jesus, we can live out our lives righteously before them. And like Jesus, we can pray that this change of heart will come. So what, what the point of all this is, is that if we want to, uh, if we want to be disciples... We have to understand that the focal point for being disciples is this law of love. And the way the law of love works is that Christ is trying to transform the world, but he's trying to do it not by forcing and regulating the change, but by calling people to the, to the vision of the kingdom of God. And that's how we do this. Now, Let's turn to one more text. Actually, let's not turn to one more text, but I'm going to read one to you. Don't turn here, but let me read to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. Again, the summary. It says, The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. You'll find that other places in the Scriptures as well. Uh, a friend and I were riding motorcycles in Texas on on uh, Sunday and Monday. I was speaking in Texas on Saturday. So we rode motorcycles, rented a couple of motorcycles. And I had, I had an epiphany. I was uh, riding the motorcycle. I think I was probably slowing down for a stop sign or something out in the middle of the Texas, middle of the ranch country. And uh, a woman and a white pickup truck was driving past me going in the other direction. She didn't even see me. So I'm slowing down. She's speeding up. And uh, I was struck by her face because well, I, when I look at my wife's face, I see a, a woman who is, uh, has soft features, who's kind, who uh, has a little bit of a twinkle in her eye. Um, just a beautiful, a beautiful face. When I glanced over at this woman, as I say, she didn't even see me. And I could have this completely wrong. In fact, I may well have it wrong, but I do know that she represents millions, millions of women. As I looked at her, I thought to myself, wow, she really looks worn out. She, she had a very haggard face. And I could just visualize uh, a tough life as being some rancher's wife and raising some brood of children. And uh, she looked pretty tough, but she looked very, very tired, very weary with life. And it just popped into my head. There's a woman who has not been loved well. Now, I don't know why it popped in my head, but, and I could be completely wrong with her, but I've been noticing the pictures of people's faces recently in the last few days and just thinking about, has that person been loved well? Has that been per person been loved the way that Jesus loves? Something to think about. WWJD, what would Jesus do? You know, how do we love one another? How do we do that? How do we go about doing that? How do we love... How do you... How could you possibly love your wife just as she is? Hold that to the discussion time, okay? At the end, good. How could you possibly love 
your coworker who has just stabbed you in the back, how could you possibly love that coworker just as they are? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I think if Jesus heard this message this morning, of course, he wrote the message, but uh, in, in, in the, the Bible part of it, he wrote, so he already knows this. But if he was hearing this for the first time this morning, what would he do? He would immediately go to his family. And he would try to love his wife just as she is. His children just as they are. And then because he loves them just as they are, he would love them too much to leave them just as they are. But he would not try to regulate, to force, and control the change of their behavior. Instead, he would begin to hold up the vision of the kingdom of God in front of them. He would make, he would make them so thirsty for the gospel that they couldn't, eventually, they would not be able to wait to, to stop doing whatever it is that they shouldn't be doing so that they could do what they should be doing. He would paint the picture, give the vision of what it means to be part of Christ's kingdom, of what it means to be a disciple and not just a convert. Our leaders get together twice a month. Bible study leaders get together twice a month. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> we were going through a time when, um, call it what you will, but attendance at leader meetings was, was down, like way down, way down. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking apathy? Well, I know these men, that doesn't seem like that works for me. Um, busy schedules? Don't know, don't know. But here's what I do know. Uh, having a vibrant, healthy Bible study depends on having a vibrant, healthy leadership team. And so, <clears throat> began to seek counsel about, you know, what to do. And got a variety of suggestions. Um, you need to tighten up the rules. Somebody doesn't come, you need to give them the opportunity to seek leadership elsewhere. People don't come, it's, it's a sign of lack of interest. All kinds of different thoughts. And so I didn't feel good about that. So I just kept praying. And lived, lived with that for about six months or something like that. But lived with it for about six months, just kept praying. And I, the thought slowly began to creep on me, don't look to them, look to yourself. Don't look to them, look to yourself. And not long after that, one morning... The answer came to me. This is, this is the answer to my prayer. Love them more. Love them more. And I said, that's it. That's what's missing here. Is that it's, I, I, need to, I need to love my leaders more. And so I began to... And, and interesting, I'm not sure, I would doubt that my activities and my actions are really any different. I don't think I'm really doing anything differently, but I changed. You know, instead of being frustrated, I just changed my attitude. And uh, now you can ask your table leaders during the discussion if it's really worked or not. <laughs> but I changed. And what, what I did was I decided that... Now, this is, I'm, I'm uh, rewriting history here. Uh, this isn't exactly what I thought, but it's as though I said, you know, 
I'm going to love these men just as they are. So, at your tables, you have somebody who needs to be loved just as they are. You have a man at your table whose mother and father were both alcoholics, and they don't know what normal behavior is. They don't have enough social intelligence to be the wonderful contributing member to your table that they would like to be. At your place of work today, when you get to work, you're going to have somebody, you're going to have a woman, you're going to have a woman at your place of employment whose husband abandoned her. And she's bitter, she's broken, and she's hurt. And the way she, the way she expresses that is in ways that do anything but invite sympathy. She's hostile. She's angry. She's short. She makes comments in male-female context that are hurtful. But the focal point for a disciple is the law of love. And so what we do, we show, people will know that we are disciples when we love one another the way that Jesus has loved us. The focal point for a disciple is the law of love. That's the deal. So what is a disciple? What is a disciple? A lover. A lover. A disciple is a lover. Are you a good lover? Are you a great lover? Check with your wife later. <laughs> By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So what would Jesus do? Get out there. You know what he would do. Get out there. Do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, it is, uh, it is so simple that it would be very easy to overlook that, the, that really the focal point of what it means to be a disciple is to, to love the way that you've loved us. And so, Father, I pray that as uh, we're thinking about what it means to be a disciple, that you would allow this, this central tenet of discipleship to sink deeply into our minds, into our brains. And Lord, could this explain why, why we have so many problems, even though we have so many Christians, that we don't have enough of this kind of love? Lord, tutor our hearts in this, each in our, the way that we need to have it tutored. We make this prayer in your name, Jesus. Amen.